Tonight, I want to associate the coming of the Lord with eternal objectives being realized. Now, of course, God's kingdom and His great salvation is, is driven by an, an objective or an aim or a goal. Christ's coming is not an end of itself. In one sense, it's an end of the worldly order, but in another, it's the beginning of the, Amen. for us, it would be the beginning of the eternal order without yeah. the infirmity of the flesh. <clears throat> you see, no teaching of Scripture is isolated just off by itself. Mm -hmm. It all, some, at some point, it's got to connect with forever being with the Lord. But whatever way a person chooses <coughs> to emphasize, and that emphasis should by all means be Christ and things pertaining to Him, but whatever they emphasize, it must it must dovetail with the with the glory at some point. If what you're emphasizing is in fact going to end when Jesus comes, well, you, that must not be your emphasis. That doesn't mean you don't pay any attention to it. It means it's subordinate to a higher higher subject. <clears throat> but in the kingdom of God, the logic and the functioning of it is what I've chosen to call from top down. Now in the world. Learning or advancement is from the bottom up. You learn your ABCs, you learn words, you learn sentences, you then communicate. <coughs> the, but the kingdom's not like this. In the kingdom, you learn the big stuff first and the detailed stuff last. Now, actually, you should know that you'll, you'll be able to find in your own life this actually happened that a lot of details of life that are necessary you didn't you weren't even aware of them until you were aware of what the big thing what the big purpose was then all of a sudden the details uh, became plain now what i'm talking about tonight is the big thing and i'm going to show how christ's coming is connected with it an eternal objective <clears throat> or purpose it's like a divine blueprint and before God made the world, he determined what he was going to do with it before he made it. Or to be more precise, what he's going to do in it before he made it. And when he was finished with the, with the preparation work, and the world is, was all for preparation. When he made the world, it was a preparatory environment. It was an area where, so, where a work would be completed that would prepare for an eternity with the Lord. <coughs> Now, any teaching that doesn't dovetail with this purpose <clears throat> becomes a novelty, and it is powerless. Now, what I'm going to say is that this is the thing that gives power to teaching, is when you can connect what we're going to talk about tonight, God's eternal objective, and I'm just going to kind of show some facets of it. His objective is like a diamond, like a jewel with a lot of different facets to it. But his eternal, it's called in Scripture, his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it is a marvelous thing to consider. <clears throat> now, my text is taken from Acts, the third chapter, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> it's in the midst of a, a marvelous message that Peter delivered. Follows the verse that speaks about Repenting and being converted that your sins may be, be, be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And the next two verses are my text. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So Jesus, when he returned to heaven, <clears throat> the heavens received him. Oh, it was a glad. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's on his way back. They said, open up the gates. The king of glory will come in. He received him and he's going to stay there. Until everything that the holy prophets said would come to pass has come to pass. And they did say a lot. You're familiar with the, all the prophets since the world began? Well, they, there's a lot of things they said were going to happen. And Jesus is going to sit enthroned in heaven till all those things will be fulfilled. And he's going to return. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
and things are going to commence. <coughs> now the scriptures, of course, are plain that the heavens did receive him. This is a categorical language in scripture. Mark 16, 19, Mark sort of summarizes <coughs> his post-resurrection <coughs> activity. He says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now, that's, that's some summary, isn't it? They saw him going up, but they didn't see him sitting down. 1 Peter 3.22 says, Who is gone into heaven? Remember now, our text said he, heaven received him. And, re, and he's going to retain him until the times of the restitution or restoration of all things that the prophets have come to pass. Whom has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. And what he's doing, he's bringing this purpose to a conclusion. That's what he's doing. He's there with all, us, all angels, principalities and powers subservient to him, serving his interest with the devil and his angels of whether they want to or not. His, Christ's interests are being served by them. If uh, Satan brings a thorn in the flesh, God uses it for his glory. This is, this is the way it is. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now of the things as we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. That, that's a, that kind of summarizes what we've been talking about, he said in Hebrews. You ever stop to think how little you hear these days about Jesus sitting on the right hand of God? Again, Hebrews 9.24. <laughs> Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, but into the figures of the, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So this is, he's received into the, into the heavens. Now the times of the restitution of all things, this is referred to in Scripture too. The language is general because it kind of exceeds our capabilities of understanding. But he, he says enough about it so that you really want this. Really would want this. <laughs> Jesus made this statement. I've often pondered how this must have sounded to a lot of those people that heard him. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. <laughs> well, these twelve apostles, they had to live all their life anticipating this. The regeneration. That's another thing of the regeneration. See, the same thing that happened to you, you've been regenerated in your spirit, going to happen to your body and the entire universe. Everything's going to be regenerated. In fact, God said, I'm going to make everything new. Yeah. So that restitution of all things, that's, that's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> Again, 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14. This is regeneration now. <clears throat> Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing you look for such things, be diligent, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Amen. See, you do want to fit in that place where Amen. there dwells righteousness. If you don't fit in there, there's only one alternative. And no person of sound mind wants it. No wonder what it is. It's the lake of fire. That's the alternative. But this is the residence I'm interested in. Revelation 21.5. These are the words of the Lord himself. He said, Behold, <coughs> this is one that sat on the throne. I remember uh, we read scripture where he sat down on the right hand of God. Well, he's sitting on a throne. He's enthroned. He that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hey, he pause this for a minute. Just the way I got now, John. This just isn't like some information I'm passing down. He said unto me, "Write." So these words are faithful unto. Put this down. Put this down. I'm going to make everything new. I'm going to do it. Now this objective is driving, uh, driving redemption. If it wasn't for this, there would really be no need to be saved. They really would. 
You can just eat, drink, and be merry and live out your life in your own personal interest without any regard for anything else or anybody else. But see, this is really going to happen, and salvation is in view of this. <coughs> now he said that heaven's going to retain him until the times of the of when, it, when the appointed time comes of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And my, think of all the prophets God has had. Mm -hmm. Some of them we don't, we don't have any idea what their names were. They were like, there were there were like a thousand, a hundred prophets, a hundred prophets that Obadiah had. We have no idea what their names were when Jezebel was killing all those people. And there's some that just holy prophets. That's all we know. We, well, there were many prophets. We have no idea what their name was. I'm going to give you some of their words. Whatever words they spoke are going to come to pass. Let me give you some samples. Here's Isaiah. Let's call him to the witness stand. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God shall wipe away all tears from all, all, off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. I see people that say there's nothing in the Old Testament for us are just wrong. That's all. They just don't know what they're talking about. And sometimes you just ought to tell them. Say, thou, you know nothing at all. That, and anyone that says that prophecy is fulfilled really needs to be taken to some kind of a hospital somewhere and examined. Let's hear a word of Hosea 13, 14. Remember now, he said he's going to sit there until these things come to pass. I'm just giving some samples. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death, O oh death. I will be thy plagues. O oh grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. Says, I'm not going to change my mind on this. So until this happens, Jesus is sitting. This is what our text said. The heavens are going to retain him until, see, at least this is, when he comes, now this is kind of going to happen quickly, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to see a certain sequence happen like this, but he's going to stay there until this is accomplished. Even in the primitive days of Job, Job kind of sensed there's more than this life, there's more than this world. Amen. Job 19.25, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Well, that's some prophecy for his time. There's some people today that don't even know that. Huh? Some prophecy. Let's call Isaiah the witness stand again. Tell us, Isaiah, give us a prophecy. That fifth, Isaiah 51, 11, The redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing to Zion. And everlasting joy shall be up on their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and mourning shall flee away. So there's a lot of things the prophet said that hasn't come to pass yet. But it is going to come to pass. Isaiah 65, 17. Behold, I create new heavens and new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Daniel. Let's call Daniel to the witness stand. Daniel 7, 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Amen. How's that? Daniel 7, 22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. See, I'm sure this is an objective. God's, this is at the, what God's working toward you. And we best be working toward it too. Amen. And be in sync with him. Daniel 7, 27. The kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So there's a few of these words of his holy prophets spoken since the foundation of the world. <coughs> So God's eternal purpose, as it's called in Ephesians 3.11, involves, these are all facets of his purpose. His purpose really isn't to clean up the earth. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. Mm -hmm. Don't even think that. He said, think not. Don't think this, that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Oh. What I want to do is set a man at variance one with another. Why, Lord? Because there's some people are tares and some people are wheat. That's right. It's because some people are children of the devil and some people are children of the kingdom. And we can't <laughs> tell the difference, but Jesus can. And he preaches and speaks and teaches and leads and directs to distinguish between these two kinds of people. Amen. And when he's finally, uh, ever, all the distinctions have been made, he's going to wrap this project, project up. Amen. <clears throat> now, there's just a, a single small word that tells us about this objective or purpose that God has. It's just called the end. Now, you can think of the end as the terminal point. In a sense, that's it. But that's not what it means in the text I'm going to read here. The end doesn't mean everything stops. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean so much for that. The end means the purpose to the end. See, that in that, like in that sense. Objective. Now let's see what the scriptures say about this. <coughs> the end. Matthew 13, 39 says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. It will have served its objective and we're going to move on to higher ground. <laughs> and the word reapers are the angels. Matthew 24, 13. He that shall endure to the end. He says it's not a terminal point for he shall be saved. So that's, that's the beginning, see, of something else. Now God's working toward this. If you make your objective, I can just if I can just be better here in the world. Well, now this is good. This is involved. Make no mistake about this. But this really isn't the end of the matter. You may shine your life up and be an excellent appearance. In appearance, be excellent, make some good progress, and memorize a lot of the scripture, and just be pretty, pretty commendable. But see, that's not the objective. That leads to the objective. That's, a, that's the narrow gate and the straight, that's the straight gate and the narrow way. That's what that is. And the life at the end, that's, that's the point. Amen. Again, <coughs> 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end. That's what God was targeting all along, what he's, tar what he's working toward. The end. When he shall deliver it up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, that is to say, when all there will be no competition Amen. after that. Amen. Now we're in the era of competition. We're in the era of conflicting interests. We're in the interest of competing, competing personalities. That's what we're in now. But the aim is to get through this time where you experience war, competition, opposition, where you get to get through this to the end when, you, when you're going to do what God intended all along, which is decidedly larger than what we're doing now. We're just being prepped for this. Hebrews 3, 6, but Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now you, here's a, now this is the wonderful thing about this. You got two chances to get to the end. One is you die. That, that kind of vaults you, kind of vaults you out of the, all the competition. You'll end all the competition then. And the other is Jesus coming. So you got two chances to like get out of this war zone. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> they have two chances or something like that. Amen. So whichever comes first, bless the Lord. But it's all in order to what follows that. It's what can, takes place after the heavens and earth pass away. That, that's the, the God's objective. God's objective isn't to destroy the world, although he is. But that's not his objective. His objective is what happens after that. Oh, marvelous to consider for me. First Timothy, Peter 1.13 Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And hope to the end. 
for the grace that we be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, some people say, well, if it says end, how can there be anything after that? Because it's just an end of what is, is temporary. Amen. It's the start of everything else as far as experience is concerned. But what will happen when Jesus comes and the temporal passes away, then the kingdom that you're in now will be apparent. You'll see it. And that's the aim, that God's preparing you for that, not for here. Do you realize how many ministries will end when that happens? I use ministries in lowercase letters. They're really not ministries at all. A ministry that helps people to be a valid ministry has to help people to prepare for that end. Amen. Now, there's different ways you can do this. I understand there's different specialists, kingdom specialists, but the aim is to get people out of this world and into the next. And Christ's coming is the line of demarcation. When it's all, that's when it's all going to happen. God's purpose. <coughs> when Jesus was on the cross, one of his last words is, it is finished. Amen. Now this phrase has been interpreted in various ways by people. Some people think that Jesus didn't, is, that that ended what he was doing. Well, it, it just ended what he's doing here. Mm -hmm. It finished his redemptive work. It finished the matter of coming, taking away the sins of the world by laying down his life and taking it up again. See, that, that's the work that was finished. He's working now. Amen. Amen. And we're going to be working then also. Then when Jesus comes, God is going, Jesus is going to be glorified and admired by all them that believe. That's, that's one of the facets of God's eternal purpose. It's for everyone that he's plucked out of the burning, everyone he's pulled up out of the mire to see him as he is, and rejoice in him and admire him and he admire them because they're his workmanship that's the that's the aim and that's going to kick off the eternal festivities so so to speak now the enemies will be made his footstool before an assembled universe so god has no trouble understand god has no trouble making his enemies his footstool it doesn't. He doesn't. See, you, someone said, well, Jesus, he's making his enemies his footstool now. Well, not exactly. It's not, that's not exactly the truth. What Jesus is doing now, he's managing his enemies. He's ruling in the midst of his enemies, which the psalmist said he would. And he's bringing sons to glory through the midst of Satan's territory with Satan loose, so to speak, and roaming about, seeing him whom he may devour. But when he's got all the sons home, it's not going to take a battle to subdue the enemy. They're just all going to be subdued. He's going to put them under his feet. That's going to be it. And even put them under your feet. He'll even bruise Satan under your feet Amen. shortly. So as the Psalm 110.2 says, Now, currently, Jesus is ruling in the midst of his enemies, not because he has a lot of trouble with his enemies, but because he's shaping up his children in the furnace. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing. Now when this purpose comes, God is going to gather everything together <coughs> into one. Oh, what a marvelous thing this is to consider. When you consider or ponder how much division there is today among those who wear Christ's name, it's hard to, you know, people think of unity as something that's almost impossible. But God is going to accomplish it in a moment of time. It's going to happen. Here he states his purpose in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. <clears throat> Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he's purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, let's say that we uh, had a real productive unity movement and we got everybody united together. Well, that's, that's not all the problem. What about uniting them with heaven? Ah, now that's another matter. Hmm. 
That's another matter. Some people that have resolved their problems down here still couldn't get together with heaven. They're still out of sync with heaven. Man can't do that. Man can't make peace between men and angels or men and cherubim and seraphim. He can't gather those kind of things together, but God is. Amen. He's going to gather them all together into Amen. one. That's his purpose. He's going to take people that fell and people who didn't fall and put them together. I tell you, that's a great purpose. Amen. The only people going to be excluded are the people that weren't ready. Everybody else will be in. Even now, the whole he's, he's sort of divulged this some way to the creation. The creation is privy to this. They know about this, so I don't, I don't know how. But we're told this in Romans 8, 19. The earnest expectation. Well, that means that's a, that's a hope you can't get rid of. That's something you can't forget about. The earnest expectation of the creature, or the creation, the impersonal creation, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. <coughs> for the creature, or the creation, was made subject to vanity, that it is dying. Not willingly, as it wasn't a result of what they did, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Well, that's what God said he made men for, was to be to manage the works of his hands. That's what he said, wasn't it? And here the creation, somehow they know this. For we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together in pain together <coughs> until now. So the creation is... Uh, Here's how it worked. The creation never has done anything wrong. It's never rebelled. It's never disobeyed. It never bowed its back and refused. Not nature. Who confirmed that was the case when Jesus came here? If he told winds to stop, they stopped. Uh -huh. He told waves to stop, Amen. they stopped. Amen. He told a fig tree to die, it died. Huh? He told leprosy to leave, it left. He told a fish to bring up a coin. It did. He Amen. didn't have any trouble with creation. Now, what cre they must have been glad to see him. I wondered maybe if creation maybe thought maybe, maybe this is it. <laughs> maybe when Jesus died in the earthquake, maybe the earth said, maybe this is it. We're on the way. We're going to be changed. Oh, they got to be till the sons of God are made known. Mm -hmm. That's God's purpose. And God has said, look, creation, you've got to die too. Because I can't put new wine in old bottles. I can't take a patch of regeneration and put it on the old cloth of the old creation. I can't do this. So you got to be made new. But I can't make you new until I've made all the sons new. And that's, that's how it's going to work. It's his purpose. Amen. So things in heaven, things on earth, including the earth, is all going to be brought together into one. Isn't that a marvelous picture? <coughs> Jesus, when he leaked out a little information about this, when he was teaching, Luke 13, 28, he said, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. What does that mean? He gathered them together. That's what he had gathered them all together into one. <laughs> now even now, the work has started now. We've been by faith joined to this heavenly host. By faith. But because there's a part of us that can't be joined to it right now. <laughs> These bodies, they can't be joined. You imagine trying to join your body to a holy angel that has no limitations? Angels, they've been living, we know for sure, for over 6,000 years. There's no man, Methuselah, he'd, he'd be staggered at that thought. So you couldn't join flesh and blood with that. The glory of an angel frightens flesh. But by faith, you've been connected with him now. He's familiarizing you with him now. Now here's, here's what it says in Hebrews 12, 22. Remember now, we're talking about an objective. God has a name. 
Here's your first, one of your first clues as to what that is. <laughs> but ye are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. See, that wouldn't comfort anybody that wasn't saved. He didn't say God the Savior of all. He said God the judge of all. And to the spirits of just made made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See, so he's familiarizing you. This is where you're headed. <laughs> this is where you're headed. Where all this is, which is in heaven. All this is in heaven. None of this is on earth. It's all in heaven. This is where we're, where we're headed. Marvelous. Yet creation, God declared <coughs> this objective. It wasn't that Satan blasted the objective. Some people think this is the case, that God announced this objective and then his plans were foiled. <laughs> oh, oh, no, that wasn't. This was all, this, this, if you can receive it, this was all on purpose. God designed this all along. You know it's the case because the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Yes. And your names are written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. So this is all on purpose. It's just that it's kind of beyond us to really see the intricacies of it. But he announced this purpose in the beginning. This is Genesis 1.26. <clears throat> God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That's why they all passed by Adam, so he can name them. That's why he was over them. They were subject to him. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he them. And God blessed them, and said of them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the face of the earth. Now, <coughs> a long period of time passed. Let's see, it'd be somewhere around 1,800 years. About 1,800 years after this, David wrote in the psalm, Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. A millennium, three quarters passes. And this is still out there. David knew why God did what he did with man. Even though we don't see the dominion taking place right now. But it is going to take place. Almost a thousand years after David, Paul, he takes pen in hand. He writes about this. Talk about an eternal objective. Now, this is this God, this objective is going to be kicked off by Christ's coming. This is what I'm saying. It's not going to happen before that. It's connected with his coming. Hebrews 2 8. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. So Psalm 8 6, Genesis 1 26 said. For then he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. It's, it's a total subjection. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That is it. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's really, they're really under him, but we just can't see it. It means it's not happening yet. We, it hasn't been realized yet. However, <laughs> there is something we can see, and it, it, it's the Lord Jesus who is a man. He's a man. He's a glorified man. In fact, he's the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2 5 says. And the scripture says that we see Jesus, but even though we don't see this objective for man realized yet, now the objective has not been scratched. The objective hasn't been erased. Still there. We just don't see it realized yet. But we do see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels, which is how man was made. For the, and he was made lower for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. But he that, that he by the grace of God should taste, taste death for every man. The next verse says he's bringing many sons to glory. What for? So that purpose will be realized. They'll take the kingdom. He gives us a little idea of the magnitude of this. <clears throat> Just to sort of begin the eternal festivities. 
my opinion, this will take place during the Day of Judgment, but uh, I reserve the right to be wrong on that, but I don't think I am, but we'll see. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? That's a pretty, pretty big assignment. So I see the world's been here about 6,000 years. Who knows how many billions of people? Who knows how many billions of people have lived? Huh? No, you know, we shall judge angels, the next verse says. And who knows how the kind of that innumerable company of angels and the fallen ones, they must be pretty large number because of the innumerable, there's an innumerable company of holy angels left and the indication of the revelation or a third part of them fell. So how many that was? I don't know, but it must be a... We're going to judge. Those are the angels we're going to judge. We're not going to judge holy angels, you understand? Those are the angels we're going to judge. So the, whew, the magnitude of it is staggering. If you were just told to judge the people of Joplin, that would... Oh, forget it. You couldn't handle it. Can you imagine that? Judging everybody on your block. Can you imagine that? The saints are going to judge the world. Amen. Everybody. Everybody. And holy angels and wicked angels <laughs> beside. See, that's, that's what we're headed. We're headed for that. And Paul reasoned with the Corinthians. He says, if this is going to happen, shouldn't you be able to judge the smaller matters? Can't you settle little tiffs in the church? You're going to judge men and judge angels and you argue at a bar meeting? See, that's what he's talking about, brethren. Big things are headed for. This is what salvation's all about, is headed toward that, that end. Salvation is calculated to get you cleaned up and get you oriented so that when that time comes, you don't stammer and stutter and say, well, this isn't my gift. Well, it's going to be your gift as if you're being tailored for. Uh, some may judge cities or continents and others may just judge a few. I don't know, but the saints are all going to be Amen. involved. Now, as I said, we see Jesus, and when he was here, the, the, everything was in dominion to him. Now the scriptures also say of this time, this objective, that's going to be realized when Jesus comes, <coughs> that God himself is going to be with us then. Scriptures say in Revelation 21, 3, God himself shall be with them. Mm -hmm. Now for now, Ephesians 2, 22 says God dwells in us through the Spirit. So it's, mm -hmm. it's secondary, his dwelling. But then, <laughs> face to face. See, that, that's what we're getting ready for. If God, if the thought of God or the thought of the day of judgment scares you now, what do you think will happen when you see him face to face? If we just talk about it and it frightens people, What's it going to do when it actually happens? Well, salvation is calculated to get you ready for that. You're not going to be shaken if you're in Jesus. That's right. This is going to be your father you're facing. Huh? This is going to be your elder brother and your savior, and your intercessor that you're facing. And then we're going to uh, take the kingdom. <laughs> we'll be like him then. <clears throat> the only thing that causes a person to fear God is that something is in them is unlike God. That, that's the thing that causes that. And it doesn't take a lot, does it? Huh? It just takes a, a hasty word. Have you noticed how it makes you feel? Just a hasty word or a foolish decision, foolish choice, just takes a little one and, and suddenly God's presence, you're intimidated by it. And you've got to come in pleading for mercy. Yes. You've got to ask him to hold that scepter out of mercy. And he, in fact, has to go on the initiative and say, let's reason together. Come, let's, let's reason together. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's getting you ready for this time. Now, here's the logic of the declaration that I've been saying, that Jesus' coming is then when eternal objectives are going to be realized. Jesus is the central figure. He may not be in the world, he may not be even in the church, but he is, in fact, the central figure. Amen. Jesus told people, 
concerning the scriptures, says search the scriptures. It wasn't the scriptures, it wasn't 66 books that they had. He says, search the scriptures, and then you think you have eternal life. You think you think that's the fact you have the scripture, he told them. You think that that's giving you the advantage. But the advantage is they are they which testify of me. And he told this, those people, you will not come to me that you may have life. What the scriptures are doing, they're telling you God has put salvation in your within your reach. Jesus Christ has brought God close enough we can... We can come into his favor. See, that's what he's saying. Why? Because the future purpose the, involves us and God being together. But in our current state, <laughs> we can't be together in our current state. Because there's a part of us that God that can't enter. See? So salvation is all calculated to get you ready for that time. Now we're being prepared to participate in that purpose by faith. He's acquainting us with the language of the other domain. He's acquainting us with the manners of the other domain. And faith presumes something's ahead. It's the evidence of things hoped for. So it, see, faith presumes something's ahead. And God says, well, what's ahead has been purposed. It's, by, it's designed by the Lord God Himself, and it's all together glorious. So for us, the end does not mean termination, but an objective, the realization of a purpose. That's why we live by faith and hope to the end, fight the good fight of faith and endure all things. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord, not just for the coming of the Lord's sake itself, but because of the grace that's going to be brought to us Amen. when he comes again, see? Amen. And then by the grace of God, God's purpose will be realized in us. God will not quit working until we're home with him. Amen. Salvation is designed to continue right up to the coming of Christ. And what a glorious thing it is yes. to contemplate. That's why when Jesus comes, he's going to come in the glory of his Father. Because God, there'd be no more need for God to withhold his glory for fear of destroying people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's going to come in all the holy angels. Heaven's just not going to empty out. It's going to empty out. Mm -hmm. Well, if that happened now, everything would fall apart. 